All right. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Alan Gibson. I work on the uh, OTT video platforms area in West Cross House. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about Elasticsearch 2.1 and Kibana 4. Uh, just to give you the context for this, at the moment in uh, our AWS current production environment, what we have is Kibana 3, uh, which I think pretty much everybody that works in the, in the OVP area is probably um, already used and familiar with. It's, it's the way that we visualize our log information, so we can have histograms that show the nature and type of messages that come in over time. We can categorize them with uh, pie charts, and we can also see and search the actual logs as well. So uh, really, the context for this talk is we're, we're all familiar with that and how to build dashboards, and that's great. Um, a little while ago, I was actually doing some work for another team that were uh, concerned with uh, streaming quality and rebuffer ratios for, uh, for client playouts. And they have information on every single client playout stored in an Elasticsearch cluster. And on top of that, they had, uh, they had not Kibana 3, but Kibana 4. And they asked me to build some dashboards for them to show the metrics that they were interested in. Uh, now, when I looked at Kibana 4 initially, I thought, yep, yeah, it looks kind of similar to Kibana 3. But I came across all these kind of frustrations and pain points around the way you do things just being slightly different. So the whole point of uh, coming here today and speaking to you is just to explain partly, or partly to explain uh, the way that Kibana 4 works and how it's different from Kibana 3 to hopefully save some other people from the, the similar kinds of frustrations that I found. So I'm going to cover this in a few short sections here. So the first one, I'm going to talk about some of the concepts in Kibana 4. Because Kibana 3, what you tend to do is you've got one page, and that's your dashboard, and you do everything on there. You decide what you want to query by, you decide what you want to filter on, you decide what you want to drop on the page, you decide that all in one place. And that's uh, different in Kibana 4. I'll then have a little example, uh, and I'll show you how to build, put together dashboards. Uh, I'll then talk a bit about import and export, because obviously that's important. Uh, We've got multiple environments, and we want to have our dashboards look and behave in the same way in each environment. So generally, what we want to do is have them stored in source control, for example. So I'll talk a bit about how import and export works in Kibana 4, because again, that's different to how it is in Kibana 3. And there are implications if you're using Kibana that's a shared service with other teams. You need to be slightly careful. Uh, I'll then talk about some of the advanced features that are available in Elasticsearch 2.1 and that are exposed in Kibana 4. So we'll start with the concepts. <clears throat> so there's basically three parts. The first is search. So search is what you actually want to display on your dashboard. Search is how you find that data. So that's effectively your queries. Uh, you build them on the Discover tab in Kibana 4. I'll now switch to Kibana 4 if I can. Here we go. So this is the Discover tab. I'll maybe make this slightly smaller so you can maybe see more. The Discover tab, which looks probably very similar to uh, the message log in Kibana 3. So it looks very, very similar to this bit here. You can do filtering on particular index fields. You can see your messages here. But the whole purpose of this in Kibana 4 is basically just to allow you to pick the things that you then want to display in other ways. Uh, so in here, for example, uh, we can specify a query that we want to query for all messages where we have request time between 0.25 and above, and that will do a filter down. We can then save that query, if we like. We can save it here, and we can use that when we start building our dashboards. 
I won't save this one just now, I'll come back to that in a little while, but that's just to give you an idea of the Discover tab. After that we'll get visualizations and visualizations are basically just some way of rendering that data that you've chosen in a search. Uh, there's various different kinds of, kinds of uh, visualizations you can have. The ones that we tend to use most are pie charts and histograms over time. Uh, but you can also you can also have various other uh, various other charts, and you can also uh, have a message. You can also just show the messages as well, and they can actually be automatically wired up to search. So basically, when you go in and change your search because maybe the log information you're producing has changed a little bit, you can uh, your visualizations will be updated immediately on any dashboards that they're part of. And that brings me over to dashboards. And a dashboard is basically a blank page and you drop things on it. So you can drop a message log from a search. You can drop multiple visualizations. And this is where this is where Kibana 4 is quite different to Kibana 3 in that you can compose visualizations that are totally separate and looking at completely different search queries, you can put them in the same dashboard really easily. So it, it gives you more flexibility, maybe a bit more power to have dashboards that pull information from more than one place. I mean, most of our dashboards at the moment in Kibana 3 tend to be focused around one particular team, just because that's how it's easiest to work with one specific set of messages. But with Kibana 4 and this way of composing things, uh, you could actually start, for example, having dashboards on on concerns across multiple teams to get a, an overall view in a single dashboard of how an entire platform looks. Uh, so with all that said, I'm going to go on now and build a dashboard. Uh, the requirements, I've got an Nginx log of all requests for video live or VOD streams. So I'm basically going to have a bunch of different requests for different paths. And what I want to do is create a dashboard that will show me the percentage of requests that are for VOD, the percentage of requests that are for live, and the percentage of requests that are for other things, which would be, for example, uh, load balance or health checks. So we can see what proportion of traffic is coming for, is servicing what kind of requests. So without further ado, I'm going to go in now and whoops, I'm going to just start creating a dashboard. So like I said, we start off on the Discover tab with a search. So if we go back, it's actually reasonably old data I'm working with here. So I'm just going to go and pick data from the time period I'm concerned about. And we can narrow that down actually to a specific time. So now you can see the data I'm concerned with. And I'm basically going to build a search for all data, so just a, a general catch-all. So I'm just going to leave the star in there. And that means just I'm going to draw a dashboard over all the information I've got. I can save that very straightforwardly by going here and give it a name. And I can call this, for example, all video requests. And save that and that will be available now uh, for use in visualizations. Uh, clearly this is a very simple example where I've just got a search that's returning all the data but you might have something more complex in which case this becomes that uh, this is more value. Uh, so I've now got my search. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question if I may. Uh -huh. um, so you did that search um, mm -hmm. based on you know, just just the wildcard mm -hmm. star, uh, and you did that with a specific time yes. range. Now that saved search will is that locked to that time range, or is that actually, can that actually be used for kind of live monitoring? Uh, it's not locked to uh, to a time period, as the, the the time periods are actually are actually an independent concern. Um, if you look at the definition of a dashboard, we can actually go and look at this. If we look in 
back objects at the searches. We can actually go and see the JSON definition of a search and we can see that there's there's no reference to time in there at all. It's just a it's just a search across everything. So the time is completely independent. If that answers your question. Yep. So now we've got that search. I can go and create some visualizations and you can see the things we've got. Uh, so you can have data table to be quite honest, I've not used data tables, line charts, uh, especially often metrics either. Uh, the main ones that I've used are pie charts and vertical bar charts. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to create a vertical bar chart to show these proportions because that's generally how we've been operating for logging. So just click that and we can now choose to actually create a search ad hoc or use the search that I previously created on the Discover tab. So it will choose from a saved search and we see all video requests pops up. And we've got a big blob here now of all our requests and they're not categorized at all and that's not especially helpful. So when we're thinking about logs generally the first thing we're interested in is seeing what happened when. So that's the first thing we want to do is split this x-axis into time periods. So we uh, choose buckets. Um, Elasticsearch categorizes, uh, sorry, Kibana categorizes log entries into buckets. So the first thing we do is choose our buckets for the x-axis. We can see here, uh, uh, you have to forgive me here, because I'm not mirroring displays, the pop-up has actually appeared in my little laptop here. There are some drop-down options there on if you'll just need to trust me on this. Uh, but I'm going to pick a date histogram. There we go. You can see it there. So we're going to see these things organized by date order. Uh, we can pick the Elasticsearch field that we want to use as our timestamp. Now, generally, you'll only have one timestamp associated with a particular log message and that will be the time the message was generated by uh, by the application actually written into the log. But if you're doing some sort of time critical application and you want to know, for example, the time that a particular operation committed, you could also log that as a timestamp in a separate field and you could draw a dashboard using that uh, extra field as the uh, basis for your date histogram. You can also choose the interval and the interval is basically the width of the bar that will be created for each particular uh, that will be created in the histogram. So we can see here you can choose to split up by second, minute, daily, weekly, yearly depending on how you want it. But generally for the size of data you've got if you leave it on automatic Kibana normally does a fairly good job of uh, choosing the right uh, width for you. Anytime you make a change here, you always need to hit this green button or none of the changes commit. So we press that and we can see we've now got our date histogram arranged data and it's split up into 30 minute segments. The next thing I want to do is actually categorize all the requests in each particular bar. So the three things that we're interested in were requests for live playout, requests for VOD playout, and all other all other requests. So what we can do is we can actually add a sub bucket. And we can say we want to split every single bar based on some filters. So I'm going to choose split bars. And now I need to pick a way to do a sub-aggregation. Well, I want to filter based on a request path in a log. So I'm going to choose filters. And the first filter I want to do is on the request. I think it's request path. I'm going to check my search here. I'm going to check my search and it's on path. So I go back into my visualization here, add a sub bucket on bars and filter and I'm interested in paths. 
and I'm interested in live playouts. This is going to be my first bucket. I'm going to have three buckets, each of them based on a filter. So the first one is on live playouts. I'm now going to add another one on VOD, VOD playouts. And if I now render this again, we'll see we've got two separate colors here. We've got a little key here that tells us what each color corresponds to. So this top one here is the VOD playouts. And this bottom one here is the live playouts. So that gives us an idea of the proportion. So the last thing I want to do is everything else. And unfortunately, there's not a nice, simple uh, query we can put in here. There isn't a Elasticsearch, uh, Kibana doesn't have the concept of an everything else catch-all query. So what we need to do is actually put some JSON in there that explicitly specifies what we want to do. Uh, so I'm just going to fetch that because I've got it pre-written. And this is where it gets slightly tricky. I'll drag this over actually so you can see it. So basically that's what we need to do. We need to put into our third filter a query that says we mustn't match a path of VOD or a path of live and that will grab everything else for us. It's a bit clunky having to do it this way and the, the problem is when you start adding other sub buckets, you need to remember to update this as well, or you will have things showing up multiple times or not showing up at all. So I'm just going to copy and paste this thing in now. To my third filter. And we can see now we've got this little um, sort of background noise of other requests coming in. Uh, and that remains constant over the time period that these messages were taken from. And you'd expect that if you're thinking about things like uh, health checks that run periodically. Uh, one other things we can look at here, this thing here. We can actually give a label, a more meaningful human readable label to these things. So we can call this live. We can call this odd. And we can call this other. And I'm not sure why my Mac bar there is not disappearing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how it chooses the colors, uh, but it appears to do it arbitrarily based on the display label somehow because the colors just change there. Not sure how you control that. Uh, any questions at this stage? No, nope, no questions. All right, all, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save this visualization. Is that the save icon? I can't quite see it from here. Yep. Okay, and we'll call this one uh, video requests. Like so. So we've now got our search. From our search, we've built a visualization. So now I want to build a dashboard. So I go here and are you familiar with the app dynamics dashboards? And how you build them. So you basically start off with a blank page and you start dropping components on it. It works very in a very, very similar way here. So we've got a little add button there to add a visualization. So we can now choose whether to add a visualization or a search. So normally the way we have our uh, dashboards in Kibana 3 is we have a histogram at the top and then all the detail of the messages at the bottom. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So we can create, we can pick our video requests dashboard there. That now appears there with a the default size. 
we can increase its size like so. And now we can drop on our video requests. Again, that goes on with a sort of default size. And I can drag this. Should be able to drag that. Let's see. Let me try and get rid of that thing there, because that's just causing me problems. I'm not sure how I get rid of it. But... Okay. All right, yeah. Because it was appearing here. Somehow that's become the primary screen, you see. It previously wasn't. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, let's just. Yeah, where's the hide? Second bottom. Yep. Automatically hide. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Just proving I don't know how to work a Mac properly. Right. Uh, so we should now be able to drag this thing here. And we've got our sort of regular. Uh, regular familiar type of dashboard there i could also go and draw a pie chart on here as well i could drop another pie chart visualization on there uh shrink that and drop drop something in there you can have as many as you want i mean i guess the thing you're really restricted by is where you're going to be displaying these things uh because i know that uh, we use Raspberry Pis for a lot of our uh, monitoring displays, and they really can't handle too many components. They just don't don't redraw in time. So it really all depends where you're using it. Any questions? Okay, uh, I'm going to move on now to import and export. So. In Kibana 3 generally what you do is you save a dashboard. You save an entire dashboard and that deals with all your filters, queries, terms, histograms, whatever you've got on there. It's all saved in one thing. Kibana 4 doesn't work that way. Instead, each individual component is exported separately. What you can do is you could save every single search individually. You could save every single visualization separately. You could save every single uh, dashboard separately. But that's kind of clunky and cumbersome, and that's a lot of clicking and a lot of things to get wrong. There are options where you can actually save the entire set of visualizations and the entire set of uh, dashboards and the entire set of searches. But again, that's not ideal if you're in a shared services environment because if other people have got dashboards in there, then you don't want to go accidentally overwriting things that they've put in or modified since the last time you exported. So you need to be careful when you're doing a, a bulk export that you're exporting only your assets. So what we've done in the Lakitu team uh, in West Cross House is we've actually prefixed all of our searches, all of our dashboards, all of our visualizations with the team name. So we can do a simple search. I'll show you it. Uh, I'll show you the export UI here. It's in the settings tab, and you go to objects. And if we look at searches, there's a filter here. So imagine we want to find only things that mention video. It's a bit academic because there's only one search in here. But uh, in fact, I'll create a couple more searches just so you can see how it works. So I'll create another search just in the same thing, and I'll call this uh, I'll call this uh, other kind other kind of request other kind of request. I'll save a search called that, and I'll save another search called again. I'll call this um, more video requests like so so now when i go back here when i type in this filter and type video see only the searches that are to do with video i can select those two things hit the export button and i get a little json file with just those searches in it which should open but hasn't uh, I can show you what I visualize it, the export format is because I did one of these before. It's uh, it's all just JSON. So 
yes, the convention we've adopted is to basically prefix everything with an identifier for the team. So if you're in a shared environment, collaborate with the other teams, make sure you all pick unique identifiers and bulk export everything in three big JSON files. Uh, that seems to be working for us. Uh, you might have other ways you want to do things. Next things I want to talk about are some of the other features that uh, you get in Elasticsearch 2.1 that are exposed in Kibana, uh, Kibana 4. So you can have scripted aggregations. So suppose you've got some data in your logs that you're interested in, but it's not quite in the correct format. So imagine, for example, you've got an SLA on response time for your application where uh, the response time needs to be, I don't know, under a quarter of a second. And you would just like in your logs to have a single value that says this request met the SLA or this request didn't meet the SLA. You can actually do that. What Kibana 4 will do for you is insert a field that's based on, uh, based on a calculation around a value. So I can show you exactly how to do that. So we'll go back into the UI. We need to look in settings and also indices on the indices page. And this, uh, this controls how Kibana map, uh, understands the different fields in your Elasticsearch indexes. Uh, you always have at least one index pattern. These should be set up in advance. We click on that and we can now see all the fields that are known in this application. We've got one here, which is request time, and I'd like to build a little uh, scripted aggregation around that that will actually tell me straight away in a single value whether a request takes less than a quarter of a second or not. To do that, you... Yep, of course. Yep, absolutely. So if we look in here at search, I'll expand this entry. And we can see here we've got a request time of 0 0.001. So what we can do now, I've actually realized I've still got this here. Just imagine that isn't there. I'm going to delete it. OK, so imagine this is us coming in completely fresh. We've got no scripted fields in here. We can actually add one. We can give it a name. So the name we'll use will be... Um, within SLA. So that will be a little identifier for us in the logs. It's going to be a number, which is fine. We can give it a zero or one. Uh, and now we can put in a little script here. Again, I've got that pre-written. So I'm just going to paste it in. If I can get my mouse back here. So we go here. Oops. So we've got a little script. It uh, uses this sort of JSON-like format. We'll make that slightly larger. So we just see out of a document, and every log, every log message is a document. There's a field called request time, and we are just going to check whether its value is greater than 0 0.25. I think we just need to put a dot value in there actually for that to work. Again, proceed with cautions and reasons for that. I'll come on to that later. Uh, but we can now create this field, like so. So we've now got a field that will appear in every log message called within SLA. If we go back to discover. We expand this. Scroll down here. You see we've got this little field here. And its value is zero because this request time was uh, less than 0.25 of a second. So let's do a filter to check the aggregation is done what it's supposed to. So I'm going to look at all requests that are greater than quarter of a second. And we'd expect these to have a within SLA value of one. So we look here within SLA value of one. So that gives us a nice way to abstract away a little bit from things like SLAs, which may change over time. You, you would just need to change your uh, the way you set up your scripted aggregation 
just change the value in there and any queries that you've built based on the aggregated field don't need to change so we can do with NSLA is one I've actually realized they've inverted it and with NSLA should be zero uh, for that but uh, Possible. Oh, let's just go back here. What we can do is we go back here. Everything that's within the SLA, we can actually add that as a filter. So we get within the SLA is zero as a filter there, and anything that we uh, sorry, I'm going to go back to the scripted aggregation because I have got that round the wrong way, but it's quite good. It shows that if you have put a bug in your metrics, you can quite easily correct it without having to correct all your dashboards. Let's pretend that was deliberate. We can go and edit this. Uh, basically, that greater than, that should obviously, if we're within an SLA, we're under a certain time, not over a certain time. So we can update that field, and now our search will have updated automatically. So if we go back here, discover and ah, it's actually reset the time for me. So we go back here, select our time, and again, this shows searches are all independent of the uh, time period you're looking at. So you go back here, and we can now see that for a request, it's point zero zero two of a second. It says within SLA of one which is the correct thing. Any questions about scripted aggregations? Anything on the chat? Uh, how hard is it to, to get familiar with the scripted aggregation? You know, it's got that kind of warning about being super dangerous and all the rest of it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's, it's really, the, the, the danger is in, I guess the danger is if you're doing simple things like I just did there, it's, it's fine, but th there is a cost to doing these things in terms of computation because it's calculating these values in the fly anytime you do a search. So, uh, yeah, it's going, to, it's, going to slow, it's going to slow elastic search down because it's elastic search that does them under the hood. And clearly, if you're in a shared service and lots of people are using this thing, it could have a knock-on knock -on impact. So it's the sort of thing you've got to be careful on how you use it. Uh, actually following on from that, there is actually something else you can do in Elasticsearch. You can do MapReduce in Elasticsearch through what are called scripted metric aggregations. And this is an experimental feature in the current version of Elasticsearch and it's really, really cool. I tried using it for some of the work I was doing for the streaming quality team just to, just to automatically calculate um, the percentage of users who had an acceptable rebuffer rate. That wasn't something that was available directly within the log information they had. I could have done that. Uh, I could have done that by fetching some fetching some records from Elasticsearch, doing the calculation on a client. But I saw that this map reduce feature was available, so I thought I'd give it a go. Basically, what you do is you write Groovy scripts that allow you to uh, first of all map data, then combine it and reduce it to final value. It's sandbox groovy scripts. Uh, it's a bit fiddly to set up, but it, it's, it's pretty cool until you realize, well, hang on, is this really something I want to do? Um, it can kill the performance of other searches that are happening. That's exactly what happened when I was uh, trying these things out for the screaming quality team. So I uh, only did that once. And uh, you think about, do you really want to put your code in there? You think about when Oracle put Java in a database, everyone's like, way great Java in the database, but why? It's, it's not something you really want to do. You've got storage and you've got technologies like Elasticsearch for a specific purpose. If you want to do MapReduce, should you be using something else like Hadoop or Spark or whatever, or just doing it yourself? 
And it's probably for that reason that the scripted metric aggregations aren't actually accessible in Kibana because they really could wreak havoc. The scripted aggregations I showed you, they are kind of reasonably safe, but these could be pretty dangerous. Uh, that's more or less all I was wanting to cover today. I don't think I've got any more slides. No, I've not. That's the end. Um, do you have, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Yeah, just to repeat the question for uh, for the people that are on the stream. The question was, if you change searches, do the visualizations and dashboards update automatically? And the answer is yes. So it means you're, you're not having to go around, chase around and change a lot of things. You imagine just now where uh, I know that, for example, in the video team, they've got probably half a dozen dashboards to look for different things. So it's all based around the same set of base, uh, you know, base log entries, but they want to filter them and show different aspects of them. So on some dashboards, they want to see what comes back as 500 errors, what comes as a warning. For other dashboards, they want to see what sort of problems clients are having in terms of giving bad data. But it's all based around the same search for a particular set of log entries. And it's just how they're rendered is the difference. But that means that you've got to maintain all of those dashboards kind of independently. Whereas if you can tie them all to the single search, that does save you a bit of time and keep, helps make sure things stay consistent. <coughs> Excuse me. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you're Uh, the question, this is a really good question actually, uh, the question was, um, is something like Kibana for Elasticsearch something you could use for spotting spurious web traffic maybe from a particular IP or set of IPs? And I mean the answer is yes you can do it. Um, basically the important thing is how your logs come in and to make sure that you actually have a particular field, an indexed field set up for for the for whatever you want to keep an eye on. So it might be IP address. I think we've got that in here. So the source field. If we look here in the source, no, it's not the source field. It's if you that this is a host field, but imagine this was a client IP field, for example. So long as you've got that as a so long as you've got that indexed within Elasticsearch, uh, you should be able to do that sort of thing. So we can draw, we can draw for example, maybe you want a pie chart to see percentages or something like that. You can see from a, you can create a visualization. We'll do that on all video requests. And you can split up your slices and you would split them up by terms rather than filters. You could say, I want to split up based on the field, we could say host. We can say order them by the most, uh, order them by the number of requests from that particular host. And then you can say, give me the top five or the top 10 or the top 100 or whatever. I don't think this will show as much interest because it's a fairly limited set of data, but you do have the facility there to split things up. It's it's one of the really powerful features of Elasticsearch is that if you have things indexed, they're really, really easy to retrieve and to manipulate. So one of the things that we don't have in our current, uh, our current uh, Elasticsearch, or we, we do in the Nginx, we've got all our verbs and things like that split out. You can do these sort of things at the moment in, in Kibana 3 as well. You don't need Kibana 4. But you can see you can filter by host. There's a nice quick way you can do that. If you just click here, it gives you a little graph here of the proportions. So, is that the sort of thing you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you want more details, and you know, if we we could sit down and you know talk about it some other point, just about um, yeah, sort of more details. But it's the sort of thing. So long as you've got your data indexed the way you want to search it, you can sort of split it up. 
um, for what you're wanting, if you're wanting like um, specific numbers for we're getting a lot of traffic from this particular client or that particular client, that's probably where you're getting out of something you wouldn't do directly in this because that would be going down more of the road of scripted metric aggregation. So you maybe want all your data index and searchable in combination with something else. Any more questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think the Kibana four we've got is Kibana four one or four two, something like that. Yeah. You can actually edit the fields in four three. So I'll show you that right now. So imagine we've got um, we're filtering on I don't know the path here, so we just add that as a filter. So you see it now does have the little edit icon. You can go in and edit the JSON. Sorry, I forgot to say what the question was for, for people that are in the stream. The question was basically, uh, pre in previous versions of Kibana 4, it wasn't possible to edit filters you created. But yeah, in Kibana 4.3, it's there. Any more questions? All right. I think in that case, thanks for your time. I uh, hope that's been of some use. And if you... If you get any follow-up questions or comments or anything like that, then uh, just send me an email or a Slack message or something like that. Uh, yeah, thanks very much.